Okay, so we are going to start. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for your participation because it's quite early on Sunday morning and it is heavy rain. According to our experiences, since we are holding a free activity and the participation rate would be only 50%. And if there is rain, it will be down to 30%. So I think it is because of the time of uh, Professor Chow. Today he is going to introduce us the food culture in Kilong. He has already done a few lectures and I felt really lucky to attend his lectures because I learned a lot about the food culture in Kilong, which the tourists don't know. Today, we especially invite Professor Chao here to explain to us the unique cultural and history in Kilong and how does it integrate all of the cultures and peoples and the connections. On top of history, we will also touch on the use of the resources. And today is also the last day of the exhibition in our museum and the exhibition is focusing on the different food culture in Taiwan. We would like to display the exhibition in different ways. So we will be really glad to have Professor Chao to lead us to explore the background of the food culture. So let's welcome him. Thank you very much. So this is my profile. So today I'm going to talk about food culture. See, to see food, the shaping of a food culture will include nature and humanity. So these are the elements that will form a food culture. So I'm going to use these elements to introduce the food culture in, Jilong, in Kilong. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the biodiversity in Taiwan. Taiwan is very special because we are a small island surrounded by seas. We have biodiversity because we have different kinds of geology, terrain, topography, climate, and currents. So Taiwan is an island rich in mountain and sea resources. We have all kinds of soils and topography and climate. Climates are important. There are four types of climate in the world, uh, tropical, subtropical, temperate, and frigid zone climate. And Taiwan has all. So everyone know, knows that the Tropic of Cancer has crossed a few counties in Taiwan. And then there is a uh, two thirds of mountains reaching over 500 meters. And we all know that it will get colder when you get higher. So Taiwan can grow apples in the frigid zone climate, or we can also grow bananas in tropical climates. And we also have Kuroshio current. So it will bring some other uh, marine resources from the north. So like mackerel also comes from uh, Kuroshio current. And in summer, we have the southwest monsoon wind current from the India's ocean. So we also have some fish from the India ocean. 
And do you know the glacier era? So there will be a period where the weather is so cold. So the water is frozen and it cannot flow to the ocean and the sea level would decline. So there were a few glacier periods uh, in the earth in the earth's history. The most recent one was around 10,000 years ago. Because of the decline of the sea level, we can build settlements and village. And also because of this, some marine creatures will come to the land. And that's why we have found some fossils from the sea cultures. Uh, Taiwan is an island, but we also have a lot of different creatures from the land and from the ocean. So Taiwan has good conditions in geography, so we can be an island rich in a lot of different resources. Actually, we are situated on the edges of the Eurasia and uh, Pacific Ocean. So if you can watch from the mainland China, Taiwan is a very small island. But if you can see from the, <clears throat> from the ocean, Taiwan is in the middle of the island chain along the coast of the West Pacific Ocean. So Taiwan has both land culture and sea culture. And judging from the cultural and anthropology, Taiwan is the home to the Austronesian peoples. Taiwan is the most northern part of the Austronesian peoples. And to the south, there are Maori in New Zealand, and to the west, there are Malaysia and Indonesia. And to the, to the uh, east, to the west, there is uh, Madagascar Island. And then to Chile, there is, a, there is an island which is also home to the Austronesian people, the Easter Island. So this is why we can be considered as a very diverse place. And in the indigenous people era, so Taiwan has experienced a lot of different regimes over the past 400 years. So basically, we have uh, the Austronesian peoples, Dutch, Spanish, and in Qing and Ming Dynasty, there were a lot of immigrants from Fujian, Guangdong. And in the Japanese ruling period, we have we have Lukan people and Koreans. And then after the World War II, we have some mainlanders, like people from other provinces. So in Taiwan, there are a lot of um, peoples from different places. So each people will introduce their own culture, their own food culture. That's why we have a diverse food culture. So we will say that it's diverse and mixed. You can see food culture from Japan, Fujian, Guangdong, and other provinces from China, like Zhejiang, Hunan. So they all merge together in Taiwan. You can see that uh, these dishes is from Fujian or from Guangdong, but they are all blend together in Taiwan. Let's talk about Kilong. So 
it's kind of a a small community in Taiwan, and but it can reflect all of the cultures of Taiwan, and it's even richer than Tainan. And we can we know that in the seventeenth century, the Spanish people occupied the northern part of Taiwan, and the Dutch people occupied the southern part of the Taiwan. So, uh, Dutch people uh, also defeated the Spanish people and occupied Kino for more than twenty years. So, in recent decades. The history of Spanish occupation period has been excavated. So you can see that some of the sites、uh, discovered during these years. And French people also occupied Kidong for eight months. So sometimes we will say this is a Francis、uh, water or Francis、uh, drink. So these kind of drinks were initially made in the UK, but the French people、uh, brought it to the world and also manufactured it、uh, in a large volume. And in the Japanese ruling era, they built modernized sea harbors to develop some industries. And then, in from the Republic of China era, Quilong has been an important hub of Taiwan's sea freight. So these are some; these are all of the peoples. That have been living in Kilong, like the indigenous people, Putian,、uh, Spanish, Dutch, and Ryukyu people, Korean people. So each people will form a village or their settlement around Kilong. So we can see. That in、uh, in this island, it was where Ryukyu people、uh, settled. Then in the 1930s, people from Wenzhou, Zhejiang came here as well. And like、uh, in Kilong, there was a there's a place called Wenzhou Liao in. Which means、uh, the settlement of a、uh, Wenzhou people. So actually, they came in the Japanese ruling period, and after the World War Two, there were also some people coming from China provinces. Especially, there were a lot of people coming by boats with the national governments. And most of them landed from Kilong, and some of them stayed in Kilong temporarily, because at that time the government told them that they will go back to China very soon, so they just stayed in Kilong for the time being, and some people would just、uh, move to other places around Kilong, and also. At that time, we've seen immigrants from、uh, eastern Taiwan, from Hualien, and also Taichung city and counties from Taiwan. Because at that time, the Qilong port has have provided a lot of working opportunities for these immigrants from other counties. So we also seen internal immigration in Taiwan as well. So we see a lot of colonies here in. And also the,、uh, complexes in Kilong, and also the government has、uh, built several、uh, public buildings or public apartments there as, as well. So this is where you're seeing Aboriginal peoples in Kilong from、uh, eastern Taiwan as well. And then in Hoping Island, we also have the tribes from these Aboriginal peoples, and these 
tribes are not really uh, available for sightseeing. And you can even have a taste of the Aboriginal cuisines there. So, and also we are seeing immigrants from Vietnam, Indonesia, and also Thailand as well. So especially among of them, we see a lot of Indonesian immigrants uh, working in the Key Port as well. Uh, you can see them on the offshore and also inshore fisheries. So we have an abundant portfolio of peoples in Kilong. And you can even see uh, stores selling daily necessities uh, for Indonesian people and also for uh, other immigrants. So I think uh, we can really say that Kilong is a miniature of the entire Taiwan because it consists of really a lot of different groups of people as well. And we see a lot of inshore and also offshore fishing boats or fishing ships here in Kilong Port. And then we can also, some of these are fishermen went to Kilong Island, Kilong Isle, and also even other isles and then to the north of Kilong. So we know that Kilong really belongs to the eastern coast of Taiwan. And here we have some uh, really deep water areas. So we see some deep water fish. This is quite different from other cities or other coasts in Taiwan. And also in Kilong, we have a fish market called Kamading. And this fish market is really the largest fish market in Taiwan. So uh, usually at 1 a.m., the fish market opens all the way till dawn. So uh, you will see a lot of cars driving from all places around Taiwan going to the fish market to get the freshest, freshest uh, seafood. For example, you see a lot of Japanese uh, ryote or Japanese restaurants from Taipei running to the fish market to get the freshest seafood as they can. So we see a lot of people coming from around the island to the fish market and also we are seeing a lot of uh, ice cube merchants as well because the people need the ice cubes to keep the seafood fresh so this is also a business opportunity for uh, ice cube suppliers so our topic today is really to give you a background knowledge of the people the combinations of people here in Kilong and also its historical background and how they all work together to give this unique combination of local cuisines in Kilong. So I'll really talk about the foods here, one by one here. So I think one of the things we can really uh, talk about first is how we preserve seafood here in Kilong. So the uh, most easiest way is to dry the seafood or uh, marinate the seafood with salt. So you can use, uh, you can sun dry the fish, you can put the salt in it, or uh, you can do it without salt. So if you marinate the fish or the seafood with uh, salt, then you will see fermentation taking place. And then this fermentation gives strong flavors to the seafood, and usually they taste better after uh, marination with salt. So for example, ham, ham gets its uh, essence and its flavor due to the uh, marination of salt. So what we can see here is that these salted or dried food, uh, as we called it, uh, usually people in the past will uh, salt or dry fish, shrimp, and scallops. And then this is how they call it in local language. For example, hua, hua in Taiwanese is, means uh, dried ingredients. And then you will have this uh, xiong and okay? ge. These are different kinds of preservation technologies or techniques here. So for example, hua means uh, dried fish. And then also we have salted fish here. Uh, you can salt, it, the, salt the fish uh, and dry it or you can keep it wet as well. And then we tend to call these uh, seafood as hai wei in Chinese. 
because uh, usually, for example, in mainland China, most of the seafood to them are you will see a lot of dried seafood in Hong Kong and also canned seafood as well because most places are just not that close to the sea. So, and also here we have another one, gong. Gong here means that uh, we cut the fish open. This xiang here, we cut the fish open and then dry it. So this is a special technique here. Usually we do this to a uh, more high value fish. It's more like um, the way you will see it in Japan as well. So usually you will see some uh, kinds of fish, dried fish in Japan as well. They use the same way to do it. And for example, we see this uh, yellow fish dried in the same way as well. And we call this shun in Taiwanese. So for example, uh, in Ilan, we have this ya shun or duck shun here. So shun is actually uh, shun is actually a word that gives you the information of how the duck is processed. So it's processed in the same way as the shun we do to fish as well. So we cut off, we cut open the duck and then dry the duck, and then make it in a shun just, uh, cuisine. So this is what we call it yash, yashun or duck shun here. So here you can see this is the shun for eel fish. So we put the eel fish under the sun to dry it. We cut the sea eel open. These are all sea eel. Uh, they are larger than regular eels. So these are eel shun here. And if you ever go to uh, Tungbin Fishing Harbor, you will see this uh, rainbow house here. And then around the rainbow house, you will see people drying the sea eel. And then what you can see here is, is the duck shun or the ya shun here. So this is a common dish here in Yilan. And when we try to really explain what is ya shun or ya shun from Yilan, and I think that really the best way to explain the origin of this dish is from the shun technique from southern China. So you cut up the animal here, this is the duck, and then dry it. So we call it ya xiang, ya xiang, or a shun in Taiwanese. And then next, we have this gay, a different kind of technique here. Gay is less often seen right now. But if you ask some of your senior members at home, if you ask them what do they know this gay food or gay technique here, they'll tell you that this is really to salt the sea fish, or seafood, to keep, to preserve them. So uh, by salting these seafood, they ferment, and then you get this uh, special flavor, salty flavor. and for example, right now, if you uh, search for the K in on the dictionaries, and if you also visited some of these uh, stores in Jinshan, Lugan, Tainan, and Pongku in Taiwan, you still see some stores or shops selling these uh, shrimp K or oyster K or scallop K as well. So they, uh, they can do this gay technique to scallops, oysters, fish, and shrimp. And also, you have these uh, different kinds of gay with seafood. So they taste really salty. And I believe may, some of you may have tasted this uh, in childhood. And these seafood of gay, it's really salty, uh, just one or two pieces, and you can really uh, feel full. With that you know and then this uh gay we can also during the gay process you can also get some liquid or uh, sauce here and it's pretty much similar to the soy sauce we use today it can be used for seasoning and 
as we call it gay here. And this uh, liquid of gay, we call it gay jap in Taiwanese. It means that gay liquid here or gay sauce. And then also, this is really what we call fish sauce here, but uh, fish sauce is uh, less used. This, uh, we call it he lo in Taiwanese. They're more commonly seen in Thailand and Vietnam now, and less commonly seen in Taiwan. So it's the gay sauce made from fish. We call it he lo or fish sauce here. And then what you can see here, this is a different kinds of fish here. This is brine juvenile fish of Yuaruku. And these fingerlings are made uh, with a gay technique. So we call it gadanake here in Taiwanese. So this is like the garden tree here because they look just like the garden uh, tree here. So you can always see it all the way from Jilong, Jinshan, Reifang, and Gongliao areas in northern Taiwan. We have this gadanake cuisine. And also we are seeing this in Okinawa, in Japan as well. They call it uh, Suku Garasu here. We have some of this uh, Ryukyu restaurant in Taipei, and you can also see this Gatanake cuisine as well. So this is really a specialty from Ryukyu Island. And here, this is uh, the Gatanake from Jinshan Old Street and also Lugang Old Street as well. They are salted seafood, salted fish, or salted crabs here. And here, what you can see, this is the fish sauce. As we said, it's really a gay sauce or a gay liquid made from fish. So, uh, compared with the fish sauce in Thailand, you, uh, they have this more fishy smell. But the one from Taiwan don't give you that strong smell. So it smells better. So I believe that this is really, uh, this really smells better. It doesn't give you this um, strong fishy smell compared to those from Thailand. And they are usually made with mackerel fish. So I think this is really the first uh, batch of fish sauce you get from the cave technique or cave process. It is one of the few suppliers in Taiwan that are still making fish sauce. And as we mentioned, the gay liquid or gay duck in Taiwanese, really the uh, linguistic professor, Dane Jurafsky from Stanford University, mentioned that this gay duck sounds really just like ketchup here. So this linguistic so this uh, linguistic professor, his Chinese name is Shen Shao Tang. So he studied the history of uh, southern China, and he found that, that the fisheries in southern China at around five fifth century AD would marinate the fish, salt them, and then let it ferment. And the sauce they get is called gei zhe. And then. They're also using some of these, uh, they're also using some of the other sauces also called gejia. So this is how we get this ketchup, the name of ketchup here, because um, in UK, in the UK, they can find that kind of fish to make ketchup. But uh, they found that, the, okay, the tomato sauce is called ketchup. It sounds similar. So, also in um, Malaysia, you have this ketchup dish in, and also in Indonesia as well, it's called ketchup. And it includes the salt sauce, fish sauce, all kinds of sauce made in this way. And they're all called ketchup as well. So these uh, terms are really closely connected with each other historically. So you can see this is the the first the very original uh, soy sauce so this is how a uh, get job in taiwanese uh, come so then i'm going to talk about what kind of food cultures did different immigrants bring 
because uh, they stayed in Taiwan for a short time, they brought different crops from Europe, America, India, and Southeast Asia, especially from the America. We know that Spanish people were the first people who went to America. So they took these crops from uh, the America and they brought them to all of uh, the world. And it was because of the Columbia exchange. Columbia brought something to America and he also brought something from America to other places in the world in particular the crops for example corn sweet potato potato tomato pineapple sugar apple peanuts spices guava and passion fruits they are all from america and mango jackfruit basil and so on are from india and wax apple is from the southeast asian regions Today, I'm going to share with you some examples of the food from other continents. Do you know where cabbage comes from? When we see cabbage, we would directly associate it with Korea. In Taiwanese, it's called gole. It's from Euro Europe because it's a, it's a crop that is grown in temperate climate. In summer, we don't grow cabbage very much because it loves to grow in in a cold weather because it comes from Europe. So it's not from Korea. For Korea people, they call it yang bai cai, like Western cabbage, like uh, Chinese people call it. So actually it's, it's a language from Europe and for Dutch people, they call it ko. It's really similar to ko in Taiwanese, but, and also for Spanish, they call it C O L. If you can uh, put these letters in Google Translate, it sounds like "kole." It's just really similar to "kole" in Taiwanese. And in Taiwanese literature, they call it "jie lan." It means that uh, this cabbage has a lot of leaves, but in Taiwanese, we call we still call it gole, but we can see the linguistic development from Europe. As for example, for German, it's called coal. So it's all sounds very similar. Then let's talk about peace. In Taiwanese, we call it holland dao, means Chinese holland pea. It is really nutritious. In the past, uh, people, people traveled on sailing boats because in the age of discovery, they all used these sailing boats to uh, do their voyage and they didn't have the refrigeration equipment. So they can only have dried vegetables, especially peas. Some, some boats were larger, so they could put some soil on the boats and grow peas. So they can have some fresh vegetables on the boats uh, for those who were richer. So these peas were introduced to Taiwan during the age. Then let's talk about wax apple. You can see the Chinese characters Lian Wu, but it doesn't have anything to do with Lian, uh, like Didi flowers. So 
in uh Indonesian language they call it Jangbu air and it's really similar to Lembu in Taiwanese. But in Indonesian it's it starts with J and in Taiwanese it starts with L. Uh, it's a little a little different. But in Taiwanese literature from the Qing dynasty, it's also called Zenmu or Denmu. So it's quite similar to what it is called now in Ch in Taiwanese, Lembu. So these words were considered as uh, introduced from Indonesia. And Taiwanese people has improved the growing techniques of wax apple, lembu, and it becomes really beautiful and sweet and juicy. You can see some wax apples which are small and dry because uh, the people who grow that kind of wax apples didn't know how to preserve the water in the fruits. And Taiwan is really good at agriculture. So they refine it and we can have really sweet wax apples. In Ming and Qing dynasty, we have a lot of immigrants from Fujian and Guangzhou, Zhangzhou, Quanzhou, and some people are Hakka people and from Chaozhou. They brought a lot of food culture from their religions, festivals, and customs from their home countries, home towns. So we call it Fujian cuisines. So there is some legacy from Fujian in the cuisines now in Taiwan. And since 1855, Kilong has the Kilong Ghost Festival that will present lots of Fujian cuisine because they have made immigrants from these uh, areas. And there is also a temple named Dianji Temple dedicated to the sad King Zhangzhou. So most of the local dishes come from uh, come from the temple because when people immigrated to a new place, religion is would be their uh, spirit spiritual um reliance for example uh people doing some fishing industry will bring maju to a new place but for Zhangzhou people they will bring the sad king kaijang to pray for their prosperity and health so the new immigrants would uh, interact with each other and they will pray, also pray to the king together. And some people just settled down and they would form a small uh, food area, food court in front of the temple. So this is how Kilong is, has been formed. So all of these cultures have been preserved and expanded to the streets in front of the temple. So many people go to Kilong uh, Miao Nine Market uh, very often and they are wondering why they don't see the temple because they just so focus on having the tasty dishes. They don't even notice that there is a temple around the night market. So it is interesting that we can know the history and sever the dishes there. 
let's move on to Fuzhou people. It has a large impact on Taiwanese food culture. I went to Tainan a few weeks ago. Tainan has a lot of Taiwanese cuisines. And actually, many chefs are from Fuzhou. Fuzhou is is the center of Fujian. It is uh it was really hustle and bustle at that time. So uh there are a lot of different cuisines and dishes there. And actually Fuzhou and Kilong are very close and Fuzhou is a little bit away from uh Tainan. Actually, from Fuzhou to Kilong, they only have to spend around eight years by boat. And so if you walk, uh, you, can, you have to walk uh, for 10 days. So this is uh, the distance from between Fuzhou and Kilong. And in the Japanese ruling period, actually there, are, there were regular uh, regular uh, shift for for the boats. So that's how they interact with each other very often. So in the Japanese ruling area, uh, ruling period, people living in Taipei uh, who were really rich would even hire chef from Fuzhou to cook for them. So when they built a town in Heping Island, they found a Chinese settlement. So that place is called Fuzhou Street. So from the name, you can see that how many Fuzhou people stayed there. And the most famous seasoning is called Red Venus. Angzao in Taiwanese. So Angzao is these of red yeast used for wine making. So you can also filter the these. They call it the old wine. And it's red, so they call it red Venus, Angzao. And it is really useful for marinating fish and meat. So the fish and meat will turn red and has some uh, aroma of alcohol. So we can use the red Venus Angzao to make uh, Angzao eels or Angzao noodle soups. Uh, beef noodles and so on. So as uh, Ang Zhao, it, it sounds similar to Ang Hong Sao, it's like a braised, it's a cooking technique. So there will be some braised uh, beef noodles. So because it sounds similar, people will also write it wrong in Chinese character. So we have to be careful not to misundertake uh, these two words. So you can see that Hang, Hang Zhao meatball is really different from the general meatballs in other places of Taiwan. And then, for example, Gua Bao actually is also from Fuzhou. And another famous dish in Kilong is Ding Jia Bing Chou. And then there is also fish bowl from Fuzhou and dried tofu with meat. We call it Gua Bao. And then there is a, a bang, a pasta from Fuzhou we call it paper bun. The most uh, highlighting part is the the meat inside of the bun. So we call it 
uh, we call it paper bun, Fuzhou bing, because it comes from Fuzhou. And then there is also gangong bia, sweet and salty past, and ma hua, which is fried doll twist. They are all from Fuzhou. Let me show you some photos. Okay, so on the next slide here, you can see uh, this is the pork marinated with red venice and deep fried. So you have this uh, special flavor, special fragrance from this red venice pork belly. So a lot of stores in Keelong actually deep fried these pork belly every day. For example, uh, and also this is the uh, red venice eel thick soup. You can also try this in the night Kilong Miao called night market as well. So, and also here you can see the deep fried uh, Venus, red Venus oil as well. So you see the eel meat here. Uh, it's a bit red around. It's because they are marinated with red Venus. So some of, sometimes people also eat it with gar uh, sliced garlic as well. And also here you have this uh, Taiwanese meatball with red venus. So in the central part, you see the red meat. It's the meat marinated with red venus. And here we have this uh, Dia Bin Se. So Dia Bin Sui, Dia Bin Se, uh, two names of this dish in Taiwanese. So we use the rice flour batter. Uh, we pour it around the size of a hot wok. So you get this uh, Dia Bin Se here. It's more like a thick and wide no uh, rice noodle here. And also here you have Dao Gua Bao. It's dried tofu with braised meat. So it's the uh, fish meatball uh, from Fuzhou. So what's the difference between a Fuzhou fish meatball with other fish meatball? Well, actually the fish meatball from Fuzhou, actually they have this uh, braised pork inside the fish meat ball. It's quite different. And here we have this Dao Gua Bao. This is also uh, a fish meat tofu, uh, fish meat ball. Uh, and there's a tofu inside it. And then within the tofu, you have the braised meat. So it actually contains three components here. It's different from the agate you see in Danshui area. It's quite different. So we put braised pork inside the dry tofu and then wrap the dry tofu with the fish meat or fish paste. So you see here, this is how we uh, made the Fuzhou fish meatball. And you, if you cut it open, it looks like this. And then we have this pepper bun or hojiu bian. And then here, uh, we have a lot of people, immigrants from Zhangzhou and Chenzhong from Southern China. So in Keelong, we have uh, a large amount of uh, Zhangzhou immigrants that lived around the Keelong port. So this is why in the Miaoko temple, they worship the Kaizhang sage king here. It's the king and the god for the Zhangzhou people. So, other than that, you also have people from Quanzhou as well. They moved from uh, Taipei to Keelong areas. So it's they are mainly from the Anxi area of Quanzhou. Because uh, Quanzhou it's really large. You have the uh, Sanyi, Gongan, and also Anxi. And uh, we have a lot of people here. So Anxi, it's not uh, near the coast. We call it Anke in Taiwanese. So we have these people from Anke, Quanzhou. And this is another dish here. It's chicken wrap or Ge Geng in Taiwanese. And it's a dish for Zhangzhou people. So do you know, uh, this is really a famous stand in the Melko Night Market here. It's a really old store. So have you ever wondered why there's no chicken meat in the chicken wrap? This is a commonly asked question in Taiwan. And do you know the reason for this? Why isn't there any chicken meat in chicken wrap? 
Well, the answer you would hear is that this gay here is, doesn't mean chicken in Taiwanese. This gay is more like extra or surplus. It means that we use these extra or surplus ingredients to wrap them and deep fry them. But uh, I don't think this is that reasonable. I would say uh, chicken wrap, it's really tasty. You have uh, onions, pork. So you see this is pork, it's not chicken meat. And then we have this uh, bi qi, this kind of uh, plant or vegetable here. It's uh, put in the chicken wrap as well. You need to first peel the bi qi plant and then you have to deep fry it. And also we know that oil is expensive. It's impossible for us to use the leftovers or extra ingredients to just make this dish. No, it's impossible. So that's why I say it's not a reasonable uh, explanation here. And then from linguistic point of view, we can also analyze this here. So Ji from uh, Zhangzhou language or Zhangzhou uh, dialect, it's called Gui. It's called uh, Gei, and from Quanzhou dialect, it's called Gui. And then you can ask your parents if they pronounce uh, chicken in Taiwanese as Gei or Gui, and then you can tell if they are from Zhangzhou or Quanzhou. So people from Zhangzhou would call it Gei Geng, and then people from Quanzhou would call it Gui Geng. So you mean you see here they must have the, they must are referring to chicken here because the Gei and Gui really the pronunciation of chicken in Zhangzhou and Quanzhou dialects. So this is there's nothing to do with the uh, jia or uh, gay extra in Taiwanese. It must have something to do with chicken. So, so after we check the Taiwanese Japanese dictionary and uh, look at up the uh, gay geng in the dictionary, you see that really the gay geng the chicken wrap is uh, get its name from the shape of the food of the dish. So, for example, the gung here it looks it refers to tubes or like uh, blood vessels. So this is why uh, a kitchen a chicken wrap get its name of the gung. So this is why uh, they. So people call it gei geng here because they think this looks pretty much the same with the neck of chickens. And then also people put fish paste in the gei geng or chicken wrap as well. So here, do you think it looks like a chicken's neck? It looks like it, right? And then uh, in the past, we put pork into it. It's uh, more expensive. Now uh, people put fish paste because it's less expensive. It still tastes really good. And here is some field uh, investigation or field study. We found that people from uh, Sima area in Zhangzhou, also called Gei Geng, as uh, Go Hyong Geng. And then if you also go to Malaysia or Singapore and talk to some of these uh, Chinese immigrants, you will hear them also call this chicken wrap Go Hyong Geng as well. So this explains why uh, chicken wrap doesn't really contain any chicken meat. It's, they, it got this name from its shape. It looks like a chicken neck. And as, a, we, as we mentioned, we have a lot of Chenzhou people from the Anxi area in China. So we have this Dao Chiang game here. It's called bean strip uh, thick soup. So if you have this uh, rice flour and you, 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 and you make it into uh, direct and long uh, strings, we call them a rice noodle. And then if you use bean meal or bean powder and make it in the same way, long shaped noodle, we call it bean strip. So we call it Dao Chiang in, uh, in Taiwanese, and Chiang means like a lot. The lots that you pick, the lots that you draw, it's long, narrow shape. So 
Daocheom is uh, soft, but it doesn't get uh, dissolved after you cook it for a long time. And it gets the f- flavor, this uh, good smell from the soybeans. So as I interviewed with the stores making Daochangge in the Miyoko Night Market, they told me that back in Quanzhou, well, people back there, since Quanzhou is not a city located near the sea, they will use the soybean to uh, make this Daochangge and then you uh, maybe cook it with some vegetables. And But in Keelong, since it's a harbor, it's a port city, so we put a lot of seafood here. So it becomes a special version of Daochangge that you can only find in Keelong city. So this food came from Quanzhou, an area that is not close to the sea. But people in Keelong, or after the Quanzhou people moved to Keelong, they put some local seafood ingredients into the Daochangge and make it a seafood version. And then here, this is what we call egg sausage here. So uh, have, has anyone ever seen this egg sausage before? We put the egg liquid into the pork intestines and then steam it. And after that, you see this yellow egg sausage. So in Keelong, we have factories making these uh, egg uh, sausages. So Keelong is only one of the few places in Taiwan that is still make sausages. And then afterwards, uh, people found that if you cut or cut these egg sausages into chunks and put it in the hot pot, then they look just like a macaron. So uh, people start making this uh, 30, 40 years ago. At that time, macarons is still not uh, introduced to Taiwan yet. But uh, after macarons came to Taiwan, people thought that, okay, this looks like macarons. So they call this the macarons of Keelong. So on Xin O Road in Keelong, we have this Yimei uh, hot pot store, and it's a uh, cheap or an expensive hot pot store, and they have this uh, chucked egg sausages, or you can call it the macarons of Keelong, and you can put it in the hot pot. Then let's talk about the connections with Japan. The Japanese people left a lot of legacies here in Taiwan and also Keelong. They introduced the Japanese cuisine and also Western cuisines to Taiwan. For example, uh, Japanese people introduced coffee and black tea to Taiwan. Since uh, these tropical, Taiwan has these tropical farms, but we don't have the tropical farms back in Japan. So Japanese people decided to try planting coffee and black tea leaves in the uh, tropical farms. And then uh, Japanese cuisines are known for using bonnetol. So they established some of these bonito flake factory in Keelong as well. We they even established Keelong bonito tile factory. So we see a lot of cuisines or dishes made with bonito flakes. It was believed that some of these Luku people live in, in on Hopi Island. They taught the local residents of Hopi Island how to spare marlins. So. Fishermen would stand on a fishing boat and then uh, shoot the marlin with spears. And also we have these ama. In Jap- uh, ama in Japanese this means sea women. They would dive into the sea and collect these uh, gelidium. So we call, this, we call them sea women or ama here in English and in Chinese. So these gelidium can be made into gelidium uh, jelly. And then uh, we have this Zhenbin Fishing Harbor here. This Zhenbin Fishing Harbor was called Keelong Harbor back in the Japanese colonial period. It's the largest fishing harbor in, uh, in northern Taiwan. And it has been abandoned for decades, but right now people revived the harbor and back then you would see a lot of uh, fishing boats coming in the harbor and the trade of seafood was really uh, prosperous at that time 
it's like uh, the seafood market you will see in Tokyo, the Tsukiji seafood market. And then uh, in Keelong, we have a lot of fish sold uh, here. And some of the fish are too small to be sold. So people um, blend them and make them into fish paste. So uh, they make these tempera with fish paste. We see a lot of these fish paste factories in China as well, uh, in Keelong as well. And then at the same time, we have this uh, chikuwa here. Chikuwa is a different, a special kinds of uh, dish here in Kilon. It's also from Japan as well. And then we have these uh, miso sushi, miso flakes, sashimi, and tempuras, all from Japanese uh, cuisines as well. And we have some Western food that's really. Uh, Introduced to Taiwan by Japan, we have this uh, charcoal grilled sandwich, deep fried or deep fried sandwiches there. You can eat this there seven and 24, seven hours a day and 24, uh, 24 hours a day and seven days a week here. So we see a lot of Western foods introduced by Japanese people here. So uh, many young people go to Kilong Miaoko night market and they really love to have this kind of, uh, of food because it's really special and have a lot of uh, special in ingredients. So it's all coming from Japan. Then let me talk about the origin of tempura. tempura. So in the past, we didn't know that uh, it, it's come from Japanese uh, tempura. So we just uh, coined this word, tempura. So in Japanese, some people call it tem tempura. But if you have Japanese cuisine and you order tempura, it is not fried fish past because it could be fish, it could be vegetables. They all call it tempura. So it is a little bit different in Japan. Then why do we call it tempura? Actually, we thought it was from Japanese, but it's actually from Latin language because uh, the Portu Portuguese people went to Japan the first time and there was a there was a a period where they could not have meat or or uh, other other meats they can only have fried fish so at that time this kind of fried fish was introduced to japan and i could not pronounce the word in spanish but it just sounds like tempura and Japanese people thought this food was called tempura. So they just called all of the fried fish products as tempura. So the Japanese people brought this food to Taiwan. And this is how it can, it can be commonly seen in Kilong. Some people will also use bird duck to make this tempura. And it is not commonly seen in Japan. I don't know if Japanese people invented this food and Taiwanese people uh, just love it and publicize this food. But actually, it tastes really delicious, the fried bird duck. And this is one stand in Kilong Miaoko Night Market and they use one kind of fish. So maybe some fish is too small. So they just put all of the fish uh, into one pot and make it fish, fish paste. So you can see that some people put uh, ice cubes uh, underneath the fish because we need to keep it cold, keep it uh, 
frozen, so it would be fresh. Then this is chikua. You can see uh, the Japanese version of it on the right hand side. So they use bamboo and uh, put the fish past around the bamboo stick. And Japanese people call it chikua. And now Kilong people don't use bamboo stick anymore. They use another type of stick to make chikua. And you can see many of these food in many stands. So in Kilong's local dishes store, you can have chikua everywhere. Or, or you can have uh, you can have pork meat uh, together with chikua. So this is uh, something quite special in Kilong. We can see that people in Kilong have preserved many Japanese food. Because in the Japanese ruling area, uh, there were around 80,000 people in Kilong, and among them, Japanese people have reached around 20,000. Because the Kilong Sea Harbor was built by Japanese people, because Kilong is really close to Japan. And when Japanese people occupied Taiwan, they needed a port and they could expand their territory from there. At that time, uh, a large vessels could already uh, park in the harbor. And in recent 10 years, Kilong has allocated some funding to renovate, renovate the, the harbor because it was abandoned for a few years after the Japanese people was uh, leaving. And this is the Chikua fa factory. It was just uh, beside the Zhenbing Fishing Harbor. When you go there, you can only have one because uh, they have limited volume and they all do it manually. And I think this thing is really beautiful. In Kilong, there are also a lot of sick soups. There are meat sick soup with uh, fish past. If you go to Ilan or Taichung, have you had the meat sick soup from Taichung? In the past, people sold uh, meat sick soup uh, on the, the race station of the highway to, to Taichung. So in Kilong, we use fish past with uh, meat to have sick soup. Because uh, fish past is really commonly used for making sick soup. And there are also squid sick soups or cuttlefish sick soups they all have fish past so this is special in kilong and that's why kilong has a lot of fish past uh, to tourism factories and this is the charcoal grilled sandwich in the miao night market so they will use the rice flour and fry it and they have some meat and vegetables inside the sandwich. And then this picture was taken in the supermarket of Tokyo, Japan. In Japanese, they call it age pang. Age means fried. 
So there is a stitch in Danshui called Age. So it also comes from Japanese Age means which means fried. In Japan, this is a local delicacy for the common people. And this is the the noodle misuago in Kilong. So Kilong people will not only use pork bone stock to do this dish, they will also add uh, bonito stock. I think that bonito is a great invention from Japan because it is rich in protein and uh, amino acid. And it is very easy to rot, but if you steam, uh, sound dry it, it will become hard. So the bonito uh, is one of the most hardest uh, food in the world. So it can, if you can use a bonito to do the soup, it is really natural and uh, smells really good, tastes very good. And it doesn't contain oil. You can see that the soup also looks really beautiful. It looks delicious. So I think it's, it is a great invention. So in Ximen Ding, there's also a Azhong Mianxian, also they do, they use bonito to do their soup. And then it's the spiced chili sauce. One of my friends uh, gave me a chili sauce with peanuts. because uh, each place has their special uh, chili sauce because they will add some uh, local ingredients. And in Kilong, they call it malu sauce because malu means a circle in Japanese. And in Kilong, they add miso to the chili sauce. It tastes really good. It, it's, it suits well with tempura. So some people call it Kilong sauce because now it also preserves uh, the very original packages. They use uh, this kind of cap which can be sealed very tightly. So this is uh, what it was made at the very first time. You can buy it in Kilong only. It is special because it has miso. Then let's talk about Wenzhou people. I just mentioned Wenzhou people stayed in Kilong for a certain period of time. We know that in Taipei, there's a chain store called Wenzhou Wangchen. It is really interesting because in in Fujian area, they call it Bian Shi. And in Hong Kong, they call it Yun Tun, like Yun Tun noodle. Or in Zhejiang and northern part of China, they call it Hun Dun. And in si, Sichuan, they call it Chao Shou. Actually, they are all the same thing. They are all Wang Tong. And in Taiwan, because we are more heavily influenced by Fujian, so the wonton is uh, a little bit smaller. And why does Taipei have a lot of stores called Wenzhou Wonton? One of my friends uh, is a descendant of Wenzhou people. So Wenzhou people came to Taipei, they opened a store uh, selling wonton and they deliberately made it big. So actually, they could not find this kind of wonton in Wenzhou. 
it's just like uh, we cannot find uh, the wonton coming from Sichuan because uh, our wonton in Taiwan is invented by Taiwanese people. So they kind of uh, change it to cater to the diet habits of Taiwanese people. Then let's talk about the post-war immigrants from China. I will take some examples like uh, the soy milk, uh, scallion pancakes, rice flour dumpling, and such a hot pot or curry. Or there are many dumpling stores in Kilong because uh, there were many Shandong immigrants coming to Kilong at that time. Uh, Shandong people really love to have dumplings, but they have different kinds of techniques uh, from Taiwanese people. Their dumplings will, will like sit on a table. It's different from Taiwanese people's dumpling because we do dumplings and we make it lie on the table and we can put a lot of ingredients to the dumplings like prawn, cuttlefish, neuritic squid, algae, and so on. But mostly we will add meat to dumplings. So they will also uh, make uh, chunks of cuttlefish or neuritic squid. So these are the special dishes in Kilong. This store is called Lu Ping. When you see Lu Ping, that means this store was opened by people from Shandong. And there is a, a street called Xiao San Road in Kilong. There is a soy milk uh, store. It opens at 3.30 a.m. in the morning. Do you know why? And this is, has a lot to do with the historical background of Kilong. So as I mentioned, there's a large fish market in Kilong, and this store is really close to the fish market. So this is why uh, this soybean milk uh, store starts opening or opens in 3 a.m. every day because uh, people buying the fish also go to the fish market early in the morning as well. And here you can see most of the uh, traditional and authentic uh, uh, breakfast from Zhangzhou and Chenzhou areas. And here, this is the scallion pancakes. Has anyone ever uh, eat this one before? This is the uh, Zhou soy milk on Xin Er Road in Yilong. So uh, usually after 6 a.m. every day, you will see a lot of people queuing in front of the store just to buy the scallion pancakes. So this pan scallion pancake is fried first and then baked. So it's a really popular store in Kilong. It's fried first and then baked. It's a unique uh, cooking technique. And also here, uh, this is a stand in the Miao night market in Kilong. And it's called Yuan Xiao. It's a bit different from Tang Yuan. So we call them our rice flour dumplings in English, but in Chinese, we call it uh, Yuan Xiao. And there's a Tang Yuan, it's two different kinds of uh, dishes. So for example, if you have these uh, fillings, if you have these fillings in the rice flour dumplings, we call it uh, Yuan Xiao. So Yuan Xiao is made by uh, shaking the mesh. You shake the mesh to really uh, coat them with uh, sugar powder. And also, for example, in Yuan Xiao, you usually put the filling of sesame paste, and then you shake the mesh so that these uh, fillings are coated or wrapped with this glutton rice flour. So the sesame paste will be coated, wrapped with these uh, glutton rice flour. And then we put them down into the water and then take, about a, take them up again 
and then coat them, wrap them with the glutton rice flour again. So this is why yuan xiao doesn't look as round, as bright, shiny on the outside as tang yuan does. So yuan xiao is really from northern part of China, and tang yuan is from southern part of China. So it's really tasty. I've tried it before. So normally, uh, I would say yuan xiao tastes better than tang yuan. But uh, people don't really know how to tell the difference between yuan xiao and tang yuan. Because sometimes even for this uh, uh, Quan Jia Fu uh, yuan xiao store, they also called, they also said that, okay, we're selling uh, tang yuan as well. So people really don't differentiate between tang yuan and yuan xiao a lot nowadays. And then they also have these uh, iced desserts of yuan xiao available here as well. because. Uh, People usually don't eat yuan xiao with iced soup. But why do we eat with iced soup? It's really a creation in, when they are introduced to Taiwan. So uh, in Pingtung, there's a Chaozhong area. We have this Xiaolu Bing. Yeah, we call it a uh, hot and iced uh, dessert. So this dessert is both hot and iced at the same time. So We've done one thing here, glutton rice balls, or, uh, rye, or these are yuan xiao and tang yuan, when they put in iced water or soup, they get uh, stiffened, they get hard. So well, how do they do this? They cook them into the hot, in hot water, so that the tang yuan and yuan xiao are still soft and hot. And then they use these shaved ice and put it on the yuan xiao or tang yuan. So, the yuan xiao and tang yuan are still soft inside, but outside we have the shaved ice that makes it uh, cool. So this is why we call it hot and iced dessert. So you can really try this in Chaozhou and Pintong. So I remember that last year, uh, there was a time when the pandemic was not that severe and uh, our president Tsai Ing-wen encouraged people to try local dishes to boost our local economies. So people treated uh, President Tsai with the hot uh, yuan xiao in summer. But I, I really think they should treat her with uh, the iced uh, yuan xiao, like the one shown in the picture here. And then uh, these are, real, have, do you know what dialect uh, Chaozhou people speak? They're from Guangdong province in China. Well, actually, uh, Chaozhou people also talk in Southern Min language, Southern Min dialects as well. So you can talk, uh, you can talk to them in Taiwanese because it's, Taiwanese is also part of the Southern Min dialect as well. And uh, they're also close to the Fujian province as well. And after the Chinese Civil War, a lot of people from Santo and Chaozhou moved to Taiwan. So the Sacha sauce is really, uh, it's adjusted or adapted version of satay sauce from Indonesia and Southeastern Asia. So in Sacha sauce, we have this, well, the satay sauce contain peanut meal as well. And then when the Chaozhou people or San, Chaozhou people moved to Taiwan. They introduced the satay sauce and uh, improved it. They reduced the uh, level of peanut meal in it and make it sacha sauce. So um, in Keelong, you have this sacha noodle or noodle made with sacha sauce. And at the same time, we are also seeing a lot of curry as well. This is what may be left in Keelong by the Japanese people. So usually we don't see a dishes made with both sacha sauce and also curry at the same time. And then also we have a lot of immigrants making fish dumpling as well. Do you know what fish dumplings are? What, what is inside fish dumplings? It's not fish paste or fish meat. So uh, for dumplings, we know it's the skin. It's made of uh, flour 
but for fish dumplings, its skin is made of fish paste. So the uh, skin of this fish dumplings are made with fish meat. And then inside, we're still uh, using pork, and other kinds of meat filling. So fish dumplings, you can cook them into the water for a long time and they don't get dissolved or break apart. So in Keelong, we have this uh, Sanji fish dumplings. It's a really famous store. You can see it uh, in all the, uh, around the island of Taiwan. And here you can see the noodles made with sacha sauce. So we put some of beef, some beef and also sacha sauce and mix it with the noodles. And I have one friend who studied uh, sacha sauce a lot. And here we can see that uh, it actually contains, this dish contains more curry than sacha sauce. So the sacha curry sauce is usually cooked with beef or cuttlefish. So these cuttlefish, they are dried overnight as well as a bit like the uh, overnight dried fish in Japan. Um, it's not that, it's not completely dry, it's still soft and tender inside. And then if you cook it with the sacha and the curry, then uh, it's really tasty. Uh, if you go to Keelong, people will tell you this is squid, but actually it's not, it's cuttlefish. If you ever visit Keelong, don't forget to try this one because uh, this is really a good one. And also in Keelong, we have this uh, Liu Long To cuttlefish uh, dish here. So what is Liu Long To? What does Liu Long To mean here? So in the past, we have this uh, cage pulled by pigs. So it's more like a it's more like a tool, a paper card that we use to move the uh, daily necessity, also ingredients or goods. So uh, this is why we have a place in Kilong called Liu Long To, and we have really famous uh, such a marinated cuttlefish there. So this is the fish dumplings of Sanji. It's really tasty. And then we also have some seafood dumplings. We have uh, prawns, cuttlefish, or neuritic squid inside. So you can see here uh, that we actually put a lot of seafood ingredients in the dumplings. This is the, in front of the picture, you can see how the Sandong people make the dumplings. And when I visit the store, I ask the shop owner, uh, do you learn this from Sandong people? And they said, yes, they learn it from Sandong people. So you can see different people from different parts of China have different ways of uh, wrapping the dumplings. And then in Keelong, we have some uh, special or local uh, seafood ingredients here. So let me introduce to you some of them. For example, here we have this uh, stewed marlin belly rice with sliced ginger. So the belly of marlin fish, they are soft and tender. And then we stew them with sliced, uh, sliced ginger and put it on the rice. It's a special local dish. So uh, on my Facebook fan page, I wrote a lot of articles about uh, Keelong cuisines and Keelong dishes. So one of the professors from a university in northern Taiwan told me that uh, she has been eating or visiting the Miao night market for five decades. And every time she would eat this uh, stewed marlin belly fish with rice. And then uh, the professor was from Nan Ao in Ilan. And I asked her, uh, you have a lot of seafood in Ilan as well. So why do you always come to eat this marlin belly rice? And she said, this is really a special food and it's uh, cheap. It's really a uh, common food here. And also here we have this Swahi N. It's a uh, smoked shark in English. So smoked shark, it's also a tasty dish here. We have a lot of smoked uh, fish dishes here. And a lot of the 
merchants would buy a small shark from Keelon and ship it to other places in Taiwan. And we not only make smoked shark, we have uh, marlin and also other kinds of fish that are smoked as well. Because these uh, large fish, they have really good uh, colloid. They have a lot of this colloid and it's tasty. People like it. And here we have this enajo. Uh, we call it dogfish in English. It looks like a tuna. And people also call it small tuna here in Keelong. So since winter is coming, uh, the meat tend to be fatter for dogfish. And this is a good season to eat dogfish. And also, I think dogfish, uh, since we have, a lot of, we have a lot of tuna canes in Taiwan, and in the past, uh, the government said you have to use tuna for canned uh, tuna. But right now, they also allowed you to use dogfish and a canned tuna as well. And also, uh, in Ida, we have a dish called San Chin Pai. It's also uh, San Chin Pai cane. You can buy it in uh, PX Mart as well. And then the canned fish is made with this dogfish meat. So, this uh, tuna can is made with dogfish. And if you open it, you can see a whole chunk of dogfish meat. It's not really some uh, minced uh, dogfish meat. And dogfish can also make really good sashimi as well. And then here we have some of these uh, boiled uh, neritic squid and also roasted neritic squid. So uh, actually, these neritic squid, we call them Tao Tiu, Zhong Zhuan, Xiao Zhuan in Chinese and Taiwanese. But uh, actually, they're the same thing here. They're just different in size. They're all the same species. When it's smaller, we call it Xiao Zhuan. After it uh, grows larger, we call it Zhong Zhuan. So uh, here we have these boiled neritic squid, it's smaller ones, and then roasted neritic squid, it's larger ones. And we will do rice noodle soup with neuritic sweet and crabs. It's special, sweet, and fresh. And this is the red shrimps in Kilong. It is, uh, it is harvested from deep sea. And it's popular. Some people would use it to do uh, sashimi, or some people would use it to do to make rice with red shrimps. Then we have flying fish raw sausage. Kilong is the biggest origin of flying fish raw sausage because flying fish will stay there to have to deliver their rolls. Now the government has regulated the harvest period in limited volume in order not to harvest all of the flying fish. But in Kilong, we have flying fish fried rice, and the most commonly seen is the flying fish raw sausage. It tastes uh, kind of crispy. Then we also have cuttlefish sausage. We use the um, cuttlefish to do the sausage. It's also very special. Then you can see all kinds of seafood on the table of uh, Kilong's restaurants. And what's special in Kilong is that we will also use seafood to do Western cuisines. This is a uh, chikura quiche. So this is a cafe by Zhenbing Fish and Harvard. So it tastes really special and it's called Chikua Quish. And everyone knows that fish and chips are really famous in the UK. And in Kilong, there is also an, a restaurant that sells fish and chips. Some, some dishes are dolphin fish and some dishes are rock salmon. 
So I then I'm going to introduce uh, an event uh, happening last year. I also participated in this event. So the ecological chef Ian Li and and I held a feast that combined the Spanish seafood cuisines and Kilong's seafood cuisine. So we would like to take everyone back to uh, the 17th century when many foreign immigrants uh, created their own culture in Kilong. So we have a four course menu. First one is the fruit salad with edged dog fish. So we kind of uh, try to uh, use the dog fish and imitate the ham from Spain. The second dish is the seafood sick soup with black persimmon and beef tomato. Then the third one is deep fried seafood with red vinaigrette and garlic mayonnaise. In Spain, in Spain, they have different frying techniques. For us, we will use fish past as the flour and rice and fry the seafood together with the fish past. So in Kilong, we use Angzhao, the red vinaigrette to deep fry seafood. The last course is uh, pela with seafood and blue crabs, because we all know that uh, Spain is really known for its uh, pela, its seafood rice. Then we will also use the uh, narratic squid. And in Spain, they will use mussels. We especially use blue crabs. If you can take a look at the blue crabs. There is a cross over there. So these are some photos of our dishes. So it is called Wei Chia in Taiwanese and it's blue crabs or flower crabs. And it is the most expensive crabs in Taiwan because uh, uh, Taiwanese people don't uh, don't grow these uh, crabs. They can only be harvested out at the sea. So it is also called cross crabs because you can see there's a cross on the crab. So actually there's a story about the crab. It is said that when, uh, when Christian people come, came to Taiwan, uh, they also went to Indonesia, India, and Japan. And when the missionary would like to go to China, it just passed away. But actually, it was the first uh, missionary from, from, from the Catholic Church uh, to come to uh, the eastern part of the world. So one day when he, when he walked in the morning, he saw this uh, crab with, uh, with a cross on it. So it, he just uh, gave this crab uh, uh, a praying. So he put a cross on the crab. And after that, uh, these crabs have brought this cross with them all the time. So it was just a legend, a story, but it is quite interesting. So actually a story is kind of a cultural creation. It will add some senses of history and culture to the food and this will make you feel more tasty. So we worked with each other to bring everyone the four course menu so you can see the Angzhao, the red Venice on the bottom left. 
So now we still have around ten minutes. So I would like to uh, interact with you, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. Or you can also add me on Facebook. If you ask me any questions, I will try to answer you very soon. I will go to Yuzhong Pilong recently. Can I ask you if you if you recommend any good food around a、uh, Kilong Girls High School? Uh, the Kilong Girls High School is on Xinying Road, and there is a Xinying Market place next to it. The market has a lot of、uh, immigrants from China, so there will be a lot of cuisines from、uh, mainland China. It's not really close to downtown, so there are not many restaurants. Are you going there at noon or in the evening? At noon. Actually, there are quite a few izakayas、uh, around there, but、uh, they only open in the evening. So, are you、uh, preferring local dishes or restaurants? I don't know how to introduce, how to recommend you because there are not so many restaurants over there. Because I. Used to、uh, go to a restaurant that sells Sichuan food, but they are closed right now. But、uh, I also know a famous Thai restaurant, but you still can have it in Taipei. It's not that special in Kelong. I don't know if you like、uh, like rice dumpling or meatballs. Okay. Uh, thank you for sharing so many interesting stories about the food, but it seems that we seldom hear about desserts in Kelong. I'm curious about if Kelong has good desserts. Yes, actually, Kelong has many desserts, and because today I'm more focused on seafood. Have you been to? Uh, an ice shop in Kelong. It's very famous. They use a、uh, green beans. And、uh, they will do some、uh, cakes and buns. It's called the Hao Bing Dian. They often sell、uh, the offerings for the Kelong Ghost Festival. They also invent some new products, and they are down to earth. They will、uh, attend some competitions to、uh, promote their food. And also. There's another food called xue lu. They use a、uh, taro and 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 sago to do a kind of、uh, pudding. So at first,、uh, the boss、uh, opened this store, and he also、uh, taught his children to do this food. And they also sell a strawberry cake, which is very famous. So the strawberry、uh, can the strawberry cake starts from winter to April, and also、uh, in the Kilong Miao Market, there is another dish called Ma Ma Lao. It is. Quite、uh, juicy and weight.、Uh, 
this store has a really good technique to make it not dry. So these are some famous stores uh, selling desserts in Kilong, which is uh, really special. I'm actually, I know Lianzheng uh, store. And when I attend the Kilong Ghost, for, Ghost Festival, uh, I think it's really special and I highly recommend everyone going there once time. I'm actually from Taichung and I study in Taipei. And I think uh, Kilong is really special because many families will uh, put their all effort into this kind of festival and they are all into it. Yeah, actually, Ghost Festival is held everywhere in Taiwan, but uh, Kilong can be considered the only place where it preserves the most original taste and flavor of the festival. And Kilong Ghost Festival is the, the first festival that has been specially selected uh, to let uh, everyone follow suit because in many regions of Taiwan there would be fights between peoples and nations and many people would die but uh, but the families and people in Kilong uh, started uh, to try to um, communicate with their enemies and they uh, communicate and they figure out that they could hold this festival together and let's stop fighting. And many families, different families, they will use, uh, use their last names as a group, for example, uh, Chen families or Lin's family. And also there are some people from Quanzhou or Zhangzhou. And if they forget about their provinces, then they would just use the last name to form a group. And some people uh, can, can donate money or some people uh, would try to participate in this event uh, by themselves. And if your family uh, is not small, then you can unite with other families so that people won't get too tired and uh, everyone can get a share of it. So I think uh, the Ghost Festival in Kilong is the one that has been preserved the most and also we will have the have the elevator to the main stage of the ghost uh, festival so i mentioned that uh, there were french people or dutch people in kilong and one of the programs in the festival is to pray for the dead French people. And at first, this kind of uh, praying tomb uh, was small, but in the Japanese ruling area, they expanded the cemetery. And some of the tombs uh, were sent back to France but the cemetery was still there. And every year they will, they will hold a ritual, a ritual um, process to pray for these uh, dead uh, French people. They will prepare uh, French bread, red wine, and burn the religious caches and actually the cash is also in French dollars or Euro dollars and uh, US dollars. They will also build uh, a military ships and for these French people. So in the Kilong Ghost Festival, you'll see a lot of uh, hamburgers and also some of the Western cuisines and dishes because we have a lot of Western people once live in Kilong as well. So, and also in Lianzhen, baking 
here you will see a lot of these uh, Western desserts and Western uh, products, dishes as well. So you can see the historical background here. Okay, so yes, yeah, so I attended the Ghost Festival in Kilan and I visited the Lianzhen Bakery and I saw that there was a really there were really a lot of uh, products and desserts, especially made for the Ghost Festival. So, for example, we have some uh, small breads and desserts that are placed together to make uh, the shape of the pig. So, uh, I bought some of these uh, smaller desserts or breads as souvenirs. Okay, so any other questions here? Okay, so you talk about a lot of dishes in Keelong. And also stores. So, do you have any store that you will you will say it's a must eat when we visit Kilo? Well, it's kind of, it's a tricky question here because everyone has their favorite stores. So, I would say um, every time when I visit Kilo, ever since I was a child, ninety percent of the time I would just eat braised uh, pork rice because uh, as I mentioned uh, the professor Chu or principal Chu uh, she's she's it's the same as her uh, she always ate the same thing the marlin uh, belly rice and uh, I actually I visited this uh, Tian Yixiang or the Tian Xia Di Yixiang store that is just next to the Yaoko night market in Kilo. And I always eat the braised pork rice and also the uh, meat pig soup. And uh, don't forget or don't miss the uh, braised or stewed egg there. We use duck eggs instead of chicken eggs for the stew. So uh, you can order a bowl of braised pork rice, a bowl of uh, meat pig soup also the braised eggs so uh, they they re really match each other and you can smell the flavor of the uh, braised pork and also uh, the shop owner will uh, keep adding more soup when you whenever you uh, finish your soup so you can really f uh, have a really feast here it's just 70 to 80 meter dollars so yes, I visited Tensha Disha a lot. You can order one bowl of uh, braised pork belly rice, and it used to be twenty dollars, twenty new time dollars. It's really cheap, and right now some of them uh, increase the prices around twenty five. Well, uh, actually, we have one question here for you, Mr. Tao. So yesterday we talked about the uh, local dishes. From Matsu. And, and Matsu has a lot of immigrants from Fuzhou, and they use a lot of red venas as well, for example, for, uh, red venas for uh, chicken soup and other kinds of dishes as well. So uh, we also told her that uh, we have a lot of red venas uh, dishes in Kion as well. So I think perhaps there are a lot of uh, immigrants from Fuzhou who moved to Matsu, and then these people move to Kila. Is this true? Well, there are many sources of the uh, immigrants here. So, uh, Matsu is located near to Fuzhou area. So, uh, they speak the same dialect. And then, you know that Fuzhou is really an umbrella term here. We have the coastal areas, we have the more inland areas. And uh, when did Matsu start to have more connection with Taiwan? It's after the China, uh, Chinese Civil War. So uh, really, Matsu used to be a more remote village, and people would come to Kilong as it's an urban city to study, to uh, work. So we have this uh, time island vessel or ship that would uh, travel between Kilong and Matsu, and a lot of people from Matsu would uh, Go to Kilo, and in the past, if you serve your military, if you do your military service in Matsu, you will have to take the ship in Kilo as well. 
So, yes, people moved from、uh, Matsu, moved from Fuzhou to Matsu, and also from Fuzhou to Keelung as well. So, and also we have people from Zhejiang as well.、Uh, we call them、uh, the Da Chen people. They also moved to Taiwan with the nationalist government after the Chinese Civil War. And they also make、uh, red venice dishes as well. So, since、uh, we can say that there's really close connection and business activities between Kilong and Mazu. So,、uh, last month I had another workshop where I talked to another、uh, writer from Mazu, and we all both agree that yes, there's a close connection between Mazu and also Kilong. And since we are really running out of time, so、uh, we're only、uh, we need to say sorry to our online audience because、uh, right now we're only opening questions to our audience on site. And if there's no further question, then please join us in giving applause to Mr. Zhao and all of our audience here. If、uh, please also scan our QR code for our survey, and then after you finish filling out our survey, we will give you a souvenir. Thank you.